looming um, um, over the site, but also the materials in the park, in the walls, in the entry piers, relate to the stone in the basilica and the library branch. So it feels like it's very cohesive and part of the same family. Next slide, please. When you look at it from above, Tremont Street is at the bottom of this slide and Smith at the top. Those three levels um, are very apparent as well. So the lowest level is the largest, that's the baseball field. It's um, directly connected to Smith Street. We know that a lot of people use the Smith Street edge, gathering, hanging out. The baseball field is used for Little League and softball because it, um, that's what size it is. But it's also used by the Tobin School for recess and you know, more flexible activities. The middle level is the play area. Um, and that includes a splash pad, um, play equipment for from age two to five to five to 12, and also an informal basketball court with a couple hoops. At that same level as the play area, but across an access driveway, which comes from Smith Street, are um, two small parking lots, one you know, directly behind, between the Tobin School and the library. And the last part of the park is the upper terrace right at Tremont Street, which is, we label it as passive use. So generally it's lawn and trees and seating. There's no active uses there. Next slide. So just some photos giving you a sense of the character of the place, you know, from the lower area with the ball field, it's wide open um, with a clay um, skin infield. Um, to the upper right are the, you know, a view of the basilica from that lower level. You know, it's a pretty impressive building. And when you get to the play, the level of the play um, area, the small basketball court that I mentioned, but also take in the views of downtown. Um, you see Mass College of um, Pharmacy, um, or Mass College of Arts, sorry, in Back Bay. And then the lower photos are some of the, it's some of the play equipment and the water feature that's the lower middle. Next slide. As we get to the upper part of the park, on Tremont Street, you have a decorative gate that was designed by an artist. You have a historic cast iron fence with stone piers and also decorative fencing and stone retaining walls that kind of bound that upper edge of the um, upper terrace. And there's also picnic tables and benches in the shade of that tree that makes for some nice gathering. The upper terrace is connected to the middle terrace where the play area is with a set of concrete stairs that um, have stone walls. Next. So at our last meeting, if you were part of that, you know, thanks for coming back. If you weren't, uh, uh, just a quick recap. These are six different images representing some of our site inventory. So what that means is what, usually one of the first tasks we do is just go out and do an inventory of all the different things in the park. Um, and that's could be physical features like the furnishings, you know, where are there benches, trash receptacles, drinking fountains, um, and then pedestrian circulation which pathways um, connect to different areas and um, which are the most used. So in, in this case, the diagram showed the thicker lines for ones that were most used. We see a lot of activity between Smith and Tremont Street. Um, the planting inventory shows that there's a, a full collection of shade trees um, and some shrubs on the site. And generally the trees were in good condition. They've been cared for and pruned. Um, so that, that's good news. The lower right, the lighting inventory did go out at night and took some light level readings and also just had a general feeling of, you know, um, how bright it was or how dark it was. The upper terrace was fairly bright and well lit, um, very similar to Tremont Street itself. The middle terrace had no lighting for the playground. Uh, there is lighting for the splash pad when that's an operation or when that's working. But um, currently there was only one light like at the entrance to that level. There is some sporadic lighting, but um, more consistent in front of the Tobin School and then there's street lighting on the Smith Street edge. The upper right was a, an inventory of accessibility and code issues. So if paths were too steep or compliant, we noted that. If there's handrails that weren't compliant, we noted that as well. Next slide. So then what we heard from you at the last community meeting was a, a bunch of different things. You know, we heard about circulation where people travel to um, some larger scale neighborhood loops that you like, um, how you connect to certain elements of the park. 
where there were light spots or dark spots, um, sight lines and safety issues, uh, how well the school uses the park and how they use it, you know, in terms of the field, but also one class can fit around um, the picnic tables and the bench around that one tree that I had highlighted. There were some comments very specifically about the splash pad. Um, you know, some loving it, some thinking that the vertical poles were in the way of, you know, other activities. Thoughts about the ball field use, how it could be used beyond just ball field, um, you know, if there was a walking track or other um, kind of year round uses. And that there was a lot of gathering around this mystery edge and people bring their own um, seating and tables to have, play dominoes or other things like that. Next, Danielle. So good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm Danielle Dessaltz for the KZLA. Um, so the next step after the last uh, meeting on the 5th of November, we put out a, a survey both online and we put some paper copies in the school, the community center um, and the, the library around the site um, to try and get as much feedback as possible. Uh, the survey ran for about a month, just a little over a month, and we got a total of 40 responses, but we got some really great feedback that really helps. Some of it reiterates what we heard in the meeting, but some of we um, clearly heard from other people and got a, um, a, a fairly broad base of information that helps inform what we do next. So while we had I, uh, 15 or so questions, so I won't go through every, every one of them. Some of them are, are a little bit iterative, but we'll go through some of the key ones that probably inform um, how we look at the design process next. So the first question we asked, how often um, you or your family, wherever you come with friends, visit um, the playground. And so um, it, approximately 75% of the people said either weekly, monthly, or you know a couple times a month um, or less than one per, mo per month. 5% uh, of people said they'd never been here, but they might not have visited the park, but they live in the area or commute through the area. Um, and then there was 10% of people who actually said they come here at least once a day. 20% of people said 10, 20% <laughs> of people said they come at least once a day. Um, we also asked what time and it kind of skewed towards, um, towards the afternoon and evening hours, but it depends on what you're coming for, what activity and the time of the year as well. Um, oops. So one of the questions I think is pretty informative is what do you typically come to um, Mission Health Playground for? So the number one response, and you could you could respond um, multiple to any any reason that you come to the park. Um, so the number one response by far was just to enjoy, relax, eat, um, basically just to hang out on Tremont Street. Um, relaxing in the park as a general came in number two. Visiting the playground was next. Um, this is just the top six responses, by the way. Um, just to socialize and then passing through. And then the next one was permanent activity. So it was, this is pretty informative that this, um, that the park is really used for more passive activities um, for just relaxing um, less, uh, not as much for the ball fields or some other activities and more active recreation. Um, so this is a little, this is a word cloud that we use. So this question was what um, activities, programs or amenities that are not currently offered that you would like to see in the playground. Um, so the way this works is the most, the bigger the word um, and the more centralized is the more it was repeated um, through all the responses because these are open-ended questions. Um, so we heard very clearly that, you know, this is a playground geared towards kids, which makes sense. Um, very clearly that you'd love to see more events, whether they're concerts or um, festivals or any kind of events social gatherings that bring the community together. Um, so that informs us because then we know how to design, what if there's a certain type of space that we need design for. Um, chess was mentioned several times, water fountains, drinking fountains were um, critical, exercise facilities. And then there was a lot of conversation about the splash pad um, and the water feature, how that could be kind of refurbished in this in the site. And there was a lot of, um, requests for more seating for tables, um, for places to gather, to continue to gather and eat and relax. And then a big thing I think that is always interesting, we don't often see this from a community that there's a drive for more accessibility, but that's great to hear because you're thinking um, to make sure this park is as inclusive as possible and 
clearly that's an issue with this site because there is such a um, significant grade change between the Tremont Street level and the Smith Street level. So where there are stairs and things like that, we're gonna look very closely at how we can integrate the site as much as possible to make it um, easy and convenient for everyone to use. One of the other questions we asked was must haves for the playground section. Um, swings, that's always the number one answer on no matter what, how many times we ask this question. Um, but also tables and chairs kind of rose to the top. So again, reinforcing that seating, that passive activity. Um, splash pad is clearly a favorite use for the site. Um, and then climbing structures. Um, and then I just want to respond to the others um, since that was a write-in response. So we heard things like more trees for shade, um, love the stone walls, the natural topography, love the views, and the fact that those are components of the playground itself. Um, again, workout station was um, mentioned. And I also, there was a great comment um, from someone who responded said she's a, he or she is a small child care pro, uh, uh, caregiver, but they actually seldom bring their group of, of kids to this playground in particular because Fitzgerald is close by and that offers more opportunity to interact with natural environment. Um, so I think that's something um, useful to think about as we're designing. Especially as, given the next question we asked was, if there's a particular style or type of playground that you'd wanna see here. Um, there was four options. The number one, at least half, you could pick at least two or up to two and at least, uh, at least half of the respondents said post and platform. So that's more traditional. Um, it's this image up here, it's more traditional with different levels, um, slides and kind of uh, swing, um, multi different components all built into one larger structure. Um, nature play and the net climbing structure were equal and then uh, the, next, um, the next most popular requested. So then two more questions. One we asked um, was, what's the most important change that needs to happen at this playground? And you can see, or needs to happen at the park. And you can see the big word there is absolutely the playground. So we understand the playground needs some refurbishment. That's clearly what's driving a lot of this um, project and this process. Um, there was conversation about that it just probably needs a good cleaning in, in, a, in addition to any other improvements or is kind of the first step to any improvements. Again, accessibility and connectivity between the different levels of the site was important. Um, seating, and then I think this is great too that there was also a comment about providing, making sure that we're providing for seniors. So it's not just entirely driven by the playground and the kids that are in the area, but making sure that we're making this an, an inclusive for multi-generation and all the community that's there, because it is such a diverse community age-wise. Um, you've got you know kids, students, students coming to you, you've got seniors, so you've got want to make sure that this is um, really a park that is open to everybody. Um, and there was comments about signage too, which I thought was great because sometimes you don't necessarily know if because of the grade change, if you're walking on Tremont Street, you might not be aware that there's a playground just a little ways away or half a block away. Um, so signage would be key on that Tremont Street section. So the last uh, one of the questions is, what do you think should not change? Um, and I think what's really telling here is that three distinct areas and then it also this is the overall layout. So we understand that there is kind of that passive park area that Kyle talked about up at Tremont Street, the playground in the core section and then the ball field, the more active recreation down towards the Smith side of the park. So heard loud and clear that that um, probably shouldn't change in all reality because of the grades and the, the walls that are on the site already, a lot of that won't, but we, we, we hear you that you appreciate that and also appreciate the balance that is there, that it does go from passive to active recreation and offers a little bit um, for everybody. So we'll kind of maintain that and the, the proposals that we'll um, talk through in a minute. Um, some of the other things that I talked about, the mature trees, um, the splash pad maybe needs to be refurbished or refreshed, but you still wanna maintain that there is a splash pad there. Benches and seating, again, that's a key element to this park. So we'll work to maintain that. Um, so and there was a comment too about natural turf at the ball field and not artificial turf. So that's in there. So what does that do for us? So we take the information that Kyle summarized in the beginning that we talked through um, at the last meeting. We take all your feedback, both from the survey and the comments last time. And we start to look critically at the site and start to design. These are very conceptual designs, they're more bubbles than anything, um, but it's in a good way for us to gauge 
the actual level of interest because if someone um, says we want to we want a splash pad, we want the, the same plush, splash pad, but just renovated, or we want something all new, then it gives us a sense we can kind of um, filter out those comments and understand exactly how the community feels about different ideas. So with that said, we'll start with the big, um, the site together. So we keep rotating the image on you. <laughs> um, so Smith Street is on the left side now, Tremont is on the right. Uh, the basilica is down at the bottom, so clearly, and then here's the Tobin School here and the library. Um, so this one we're going to probably focus a little bit more on the recreation side and the ball field, but I just wanted to, so you can all understand um, the dugouts that are working here. It's the skinned infield for softball and little league. Um, again, the play and then the, the passive area. And then it's also key is this connection. That's a vehicular connection from Smith Street to the two parking lots that terminates at that second parking lot just behind the library. So as an initial concept, we looked um, at, the, rec at the, um, the existing ball field and we heard there was a few comments to talk about creating a, a better connection through the site, but also around the site and the, the, the idea of potentially creating um, a, a walking loop through the site. So we took a look at that so it starts with the ball field. So again, this is little league softball field. So ideally a little league field has um, a 200 foot outfield fence, that's to outfield fence to left field and right field. Um, so currently in its current condition, the ball field, let me go back a bit. This is just about 200 feet right here, which if you follow a line, it's a little shy of that 200 feet on the right field. Um, so we, we looked at what if we did add this walking loop. So the orange here will represent pedestrian circulation. So where you might walk, where there's a path or trail or paved surface to walk on. Um, the pink here is the vehicular connection. So again, connects to Smith Street and then to the two parking lots, but ends right there. So we're looking at a couple of different things here. One, can we make a, a safer, dedicated pedestrian route that connects Smith Street all the elements in the park, all the way up to Tremont Street. Um, we're, we're looking at doing that, the, the potential of separating that so you're not walking in the roadway. And then there's the walking loop. So this ball field as it is, essentially maximizes um, that the field or the, the space between the, the sidewalk and this, um, this represents the retaining wall that's out there. So, if we were to add a walkway back here that was separate from the ball field, it would mean adjusting the ball field up slightly or sh and shortening the, um, the outfield fence line. So we wouldn't have necessarily 200 feet um, to the outfield or to the foul poles. The other option is we can still maybe get um, a pathway in there, but it, that it cannot be used at the same time as the ball field. So if you have, um, if this is the dugout area and you have people, uh, you know, 15 people in there playing a ball game, that would be really kind of uncomfortable to walk through that space. And you've got um, possibly walking through the outfield. So um, that's option alternative A. Alternative B is we actually maintaining that infield, that ball field where it is, not creating that access around the ball field, um, but maintaining that fence line, adding actually adding a 200 foot or an outfield fence line at that 200 foot limit, which would run into the, uh, the, the, the wall here that's existing, but that might allow us to put a fitness area um, kind of just beyond the outfield, between the outfield and the slope that comes through here and that, and that drive area. Um, having that fence line can help protect um, the people in that fitness area, but we do, if there's any of the people who use um, little leaguers out there or softballers that use this field, we're kind of curious how far um, the people are using it, if they're hitting it beyond that, that beyond the foul poles. Um, and so that would tell us how high that fence would need to be or if that's even realistic. So I think we're, either way, we're gonna improve the sidewalk connection. Um, we have to make, um, 
amendments for the access for the stairs, for the handrails, and the, for the ramp here technically doesn't meet codes, so we'd be adjusting that. So while we're adjusting that, again, we heard it'd be nice to have tables and chairs for the people that are using it. If people are bringing their own chairs, they're sitting on the wall, but they're bringing their own chairs, they're bringing their own tables. Can we create some sort of um, seating area? along that. So we do have some pretty mature trees that we probably don't want to get rid of because they're in pretty fairly decent shape, as Kyle mentioned. Um, so if this area, if we're reworking that area with the stairs and the ramp back there, can we reconfigure that to add a seating area in that connection or in that little nook there? Um, yeah, so when you look at them side by side, you know, there are some common elements and there's some differences. And this is where when we get through the presentation, we'll want to get more feedback from you. So what's most important to have the 200 foot Little League in baseball, uh, softball um, field size with or without a fence. Um, so this option doesn't have the fence so that the walking is unobstructed and any leftover space is contained within the fence that goes along the driveway. And this has an outfield fence and that leftover space is then could be used for fitness equipment. Now, the question is, uh, and the other thing to just consider is that this isn't for baseball or softball all the time. Um, there is an opportunity for this to be have multi-use. You, know, you could fit a U9 soccer field, which is little kids, you know, the nine refers to age without overlapping the infield. Um, the other question is, is the fitness equipment a good idea? Is this the right location, you know, across from the Tobin School, or should it be spread out throughout the park, or is it not appropriate here? The other thing that's common, and we're and Danielle mentioned, is that we're going to study this, is the accessibility along that driveway, um, because it would be nice. And you know, I was out there again today, and everybody who walks this route, you know, is in the middle of the road, and. I imagine, you know, when school is in session, there are pretty defined times when there's busy traffic coming in one direction and out another, but then some sporadic during the day. But it's a conflict we try to avoid. And otherwise, as Danielle mentioned, the, the other differentiator is, do we defi define seating up at the elevation of the ball field, but off the sidewalk, just to have some tables and chairs for flexibility other than what is um, works on the edge of that wall? So now uh, the playground area. So working our way up towards Tremont Street. So again, the existing conditions, we've got wall running all this length. Of course, we've got it between the Basilica and then there's this defining wall. These are the stairs and the um, more substantial wall here, that sloped um, turf area that we did talk a little bit about last time. And then a small area with a fair amount of trees. We've got the splash pad, the basketball hoop, um, and then swings and two different structures for two different age groups. So we've got three alternatives to look at tonight for this area. So one is, or A, this one, <laughs> A, we'll call it, is essentially kind of a refreshment of what's there now. Maintaining the splash pad, but up, give it some upgrades. Um, make sure everything's in working order, redo the surfacing, um, things like that. Maintaining the, the trees around the splash pad as well. Um, and then maintaining the circulation, maintaining the stairs as is, keeping the open lawn as is, but refreshing, refurbishing the, the lawn, the turf itself. Um, and then we've included here a large um, a six to eight bay or a four bay swing bank of six to eight swings, depending on the sizes and the swings that we put in there. If we put some group swings, you know, um, a little less swings you get, less you can put more people on them. But I kind of like the idea <laughs> of a swing on this side where you're right um, near the wall. So then you get those amazing views in front of you as you're swinging. I think that would be extraordinary. Um, but just one alternative. And then, so we've got a two to five um, area for, for equipment here. So again, kind of a post and platform, a bigger structure, maybe a smaller component, some other things. Um, and then a larger five to 12 um, play area over here. This maintains the ledge, it maintains this existing um, wall segment and the slope up here. We would have to look at um, hand, uh, 
guardrails and things like that and refreshing all the turf and um I don't, and this one, the accessible walkway, we've done a little bit of a grading study to make sure we can do this, but from the passive, from the Tremont Street level, this would be our accessible walkway. It doesn't currently meet code, but we can easily make it meet code to get into the park this way. Um, one of the things we're also looking at is um, there are regulations that, or guidelines rather, that suggest that a park um, with vehicular circulation nearby uh, sorry, but the playground with vehicular circulation nearby should be enclosed. So we're looking at whether or not that should be a fully enclosed playground with a, with gates. Uh, so alternative B, we've shaken things up a little bit. One of the first things we want to do if we have the stairs here, if we can make an inclusive, um, an ADA ramp within the playground space so that you've got um, the connections, both inclusive or all inclusive together, that would be ideal. Um, there is over 11 feet of grade change. So that would require, if you're thinking of a traditional ramp with handrails, that requires at least five segments. So it's a, a lot of um, a lot of grading, a lot of work to do, but it can certainly be done. It does require removing that um, stone wall segment that's there now. Um, so then what we've done is instead of having the swings as your overlook, we've, we've relocated the splash pad toward the edge. Now, one of the things this does, if we're only using the splash pad, say 10 to 12 weeks out of the year, the rest of the time, this creates kind of a hardscape area, a plaza, if you will, that kind of draw, might draw more people into, uh, from the community into the site so you can enjoy more of those views from this middle ground. The idea of kind of making the playground inclusive to everybody um, and have more of a, a purpose. If you don't have children, you still have a reason to, to come down and enjoy some of those views and appreciate some of those amenities. The other thing we've done um, is that we might um, do add some planting to this sloped lawn area um, with the idea of providing more shade to the, the playground area, um, but creating a, 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 a level lawn space in here that a portion of it could be used for play. And it can also be some, um, some picnic tables or something that the um, school could use, uh, everyone can use, but the school could use as well. Um, for lunchtime. We have a smaller swing bank in this corner um, with three to four swings. And then we've got the two to five play area towards the center um, of the part of the playground segment. And then a larger five to 12 year, um, five to 12 year old play area. The other thing we've done since we've removed this wall segment and we do have some topography on that corner currently and the ledge, we thought it'd be interesting to kind of play with the idea of a, an adventure play space. Um, there was some talk about, or some interest in nature play for the for the play for the playground. Um, so we wanted to think about how we could kind of provide a different uh, a different theme or a different idea of of play aside from the traditional post and platform, kind of mix things up a little bit. So this is something maybe it could be a rock climbing wall to kind of work with the um, the the topography that's there, or just something that's a little bit different from the structures. Um, and then we're um, and this one, the dark green is worth pointing out. The dark green, actually, this is slipped. Um, to maintain, we're trying to maintain as many trees as possible, but if we are changing the structure on the splash pad, um, it might require removing some of those pear trees that are at the center. They're also at a slightly different grade than the, the current finished grade. Um, they're raised above with a curb. So the third alternative for the playground area, again, uses this connection for the accessible walkway along that, that path. Um, what we've done here is shown removing the existing stairs, kind of uh, breaking into that wall a little bit to open it up to make this terrace feel a little bit more integrated with the upper terrace, the, the passive area on Tremont Street, and to draw people in, to draw more of the community into it so they feel like it's more um, not just a playground. Um, then thinking about the idea that people um, responded that events, having more events on the site would be ideal or, or um, would be desired. So then again, 
if the splash pad is only going to be used 10 to 12 weeks out of the year, can we make that something else? So can we use that splash pad area as, as a stage or a performance space um, and then have the seating on this amphitheater steps? Um, then we've behind that, we've got, um, we can kind of frame that splash pad area a little bit with some trees. Um, we've got a seating area, more dining or dining tables that everyone can use school can use them during school hours and more people can filter down um, from Termont Street with um, meals as they do now, just sitting on the upper tires, but bringing them into the site more. Uh, we have the big swing bank again, two to five equipment, five to 12 year old equipment. And then in that corner, again, we'd be removing that wall segment that's currently here. So in this corner, we're talk looking at, you know, if we have one of those big net climbing structures that reaches up to the height, um, of this upper terrace on Tremont Street. So if you're a kid and you're climbing up here, you might be able to see back over the wall and see the Tremont Street action, which I think would be kind of fun. Um, so I'll let Kyle summarize. So I know we're hitting you with a lot of information, um, and, but don't panic because you'll have, we can go back to these and review. And also one thing we hope to do afterwards is have an online survey that will have each one of these options that you can comment on or even pick favorites. So I'll go through them all um, and try to just point out the key differentiators. So with concept one, I think you know the what I take away from that is it's most like what's there now. We try to move around less infrastructure. So the water feature in the center would be refurbished um, using the vertical poles and getting the lights to work again, redoing the pavement, but keeping it and the trees in the center. And then the play area is around that, although it moves around the features. It has the two to five area where the basketball court is, the five to 12 kind of on this whole side, and then a central um, swing that has swings that are for the smaller kids and the older kids. Concept B is different. Um, so, and we've broken the mold of having the splash pad in the center and it's on the edge here. And it doesn't have to use the equipment that's there now. It could be if the artist thought that was appropriate and we wanted to reuse it and reconfigure it, or it could be something different. Um, maybe it doesn't have vertical elements. And um, this also has the adventure play area that has equipment that's themed, you know, um, with inspiration from the ledge. And then we're adding trees to kind of bound that lawn to provide more shade and gathering for what is a a passive space. Um, and we would also increase the lawn area. So this whole entry um, here could be used for passive space and could have um, picnic tables on it as well. Option C um, is the most dramatic in terms of adding amphitheater style stairs. So the existing stairs would be removed. This is more opened up and makes a more um, deliberate connection here. Um, the water feature is in the center, but probably isn't like it what it is now because you're imagining it outside of the time that it's in use that it's more like a stage. So here's where the audience is. This could be a stage. And then there's formalized seating on pavement on the other side. So this is a real gathering space. Think of it as intergenerational. So this isn't just a play space. The community space kind of goes right down the spine here. And then the play is on the edge, including um, common swings, two to five, five to 12. And then as Danielle mentioned, that net climber that vertically kind of connects this space to the one at the upper level. Okay, so then we have the Passive Park on Tremont Street. So this is clearly the smallest of the areas. Um, we've, since it's a little tough to read with the, the nice dense canopy that you have, we kind of overlaid the, the survey. So we have a series of pathways that kind of run through. This is um, the pathway that runs down the slope. Now there's a ramp um, there, as I mentioned, it doesn't quite meet code. Um, and then the pathway here. So we've got gateway here on Tremont Street, the bigger gateway with the more ornamental structure, and then the smaller, uh, another small gateway um, close to the library. So for this option, so we've got, again, three alternatives to look at and to discuss. Um, this alternative is a 
I, they're all fairly passive, but we're kind of reconstructing what's there. Um, we have a broad open lawn. We're maintaining more or less the circulation. We've got the three connection points through there and the center one through the gate. We've got lawn on either side. Um, we're kind of removing the shrubs that, um, that screen a lot of the views and trying to open up the site and increase the, the visual connection between the two levels. Um, adding, so these brown bars are all be benches. So we'd have a lot of benches on site as this option and then some other lawn or planting areas. Um, but again, maintaining most of the walls that are there and the fencing that's there now, just kind of reworking the planting and the forms um, inside that area. Maintaining all the trees as well, the existing trees and adding one or two. Um, Alternative B, so this one works with that amphitheater option that we just talked about for the play area. So this would align again, um, kind of creating that central spine on that main gateway. We'd have a walkway. This is, would be a big um, kind of plaza area to, to work to kind of draw you in and down the site or to, to kind of enhance um, the idea that the views of the city skyline well beyond the park. Um, we have a smaller lawn area this time focused on this side on the basilica side um, with a seating area around that great big tree that you have now. Um, so it'd be tables and chairs in that area. So that would be a, more of a hardscape, um, hard surface. So fully accessible. And then again, our, we'd have that connection, um, that accessible connection down um, both to the library, but to um, the playground area. We've got, so this one, we've got a mix of both tables and chairs and some benches on the site as well. And then the third option, um, we have go back to more open lawn area. Um, there was conversations about festivals and if you're setting up booths or things like that, then, then, a, then a level um, turf area that you could walk onto or sit on and relax on. It would be nice to have uh, just off Tremont Street. Um, this we have a few benches in this area we could probably put a couple more in there but this one we're also thinking about how parks needs to maintain um the site and so having broader areas of hardscape that makes it easier for them to maintain um trash and trees and, and vegetation um but also so if you remember this or as you probably know this wall connects but there's a pillar here and a pillar here and in between those two pillars there's um, a fence so what we're looking at is we could kind of bump out that fence a little bit create a little bit of a terrace um, just lift the grade up a little bit a couple feet to make this all flush so then again you're kind of drawing um, the community in and looking over to the terrace and giving them more seating area um, but also being able to make it feel a little bit more integrated into the rest of the park. You're, Kyle, you're... Got it. Got it. <laughs> the three different schemes, you know, you have to look, particularly when you look at them all together, you see the differences. And, you know, what is different than there, what's there today? I mean, if you were to quiz me, I wouldn't have guessed that this is actually most similar to the existing path shape. I would have thought it was one of these other ones. Um, and there is no path interior to the park right now, um, parallel to Tremont, the Tremont Street sidewalk gets you that direction. So option A adds an interior walkway. So you have walkways around the lawn that shape that space. And the central walkway exists. Um, the other thing to note is that no matter what, we're gonna be redoing these pathways. Some of them don't comply with accessibility rules, you know, in terms of the cross slope or the longitudinal slopes. So we're going to touch them. Um, so here's an opportunity to fine tune them or make dramatic changes. So um, as Danielle mentioned, you know, we have this strong central access that works with those stairs that then relates to the playground. And then we could have defined paved space that has tables and chairs, but a little more visible from Tremont Street but still gets the shade from that um, tree. And then, you know, there's not another opportunity to do the same idea as that paved space with tables and chairs, but bring it out and open and make a little bit more of a connection to the next level by pushing it out a little bit. Thank you. 
So then we kind of just for the the passive park area and the the playground area combine a couple options to may, maybe make it a little bit easier to digest or think about how they might work together. Ultimately, we could probably make most of them work in one way or another, but I think this is a way to kind of see how they might integrate a little bit better. Um, so here we've combined, this was option C for the passive park and A um, for the playground. So the playground here doesn't change a whole lot, um, at least in overall design layout, but then we have that terrace that can bump out where you can have um, you know, tables, people relaxing and watching the play from Tremont Street or the Tremont Street level. Here we combined, I think this was B for the playground where we have the ADA ramp. So we have all of this um, circulation in the middle and we have, this was option A for the, <clears throat> for the passive park with a more open lawn area, but more circulation as Kyle noted in that passive area. So, um, and then the bigger lawn on the lower level and the splash pad push further out. And then this one, this just made sense because we have the amphitheater option in both of these. So we have um, the amphitheater here with that open plaza area, a little bit of a lawn area, less lawn area here with the, um, than the other concepts, the dining seating area here with a bigger seating um, tables and chairs at the lower level between the splash pad and the swings and then the, the net climber. Um, so that's kind of what we have for you. Um, we can open it up for some conversation. I think B, you want to yeah some more comments? Um, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, thank you guys so much for for walking us through all of that. And um, there's some really great and interesting ideas. And you know, they propose a lot of different things. So we um, we would love to hear what you guys think. Um, if you just as sort of a, a refresher, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand um, and we can call on you and allow you to unmute yourself. Um, or if you are calling in, um, I think it's uh, star nine um, to raise your hand. So I think we'll start off. There were a couple of questions in our Q&A that were submitted during our talk. So we'll start off there, I think. Um, We've got Simon Paolo says, the thing I think we should put in the new park is a new design for the playground with different colors and different tools and activities to do. Another thing I think we should add is a new basketball court that is full court, like one in the NBA. Um, that is interesting. Design team, do you have any, any thoughts on, on those suggestions? Well, let's talk about the basketball court first because it would be helpful to get more feedback on that. Um, because I think the basketball hoops on the playground level are very informal and just, you know, it's, it's not meant to be a real pickup game because there's just not that space. But if a full court were desired, it would probably have to be at the ball field level. And then there would be a decision to be made of what's more important for that land use, courts or a court and um, fields. So I'd be curious just to hear from the community what thoughts are on that. So I think someone raised their hand. We've got do, 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 Emily. Emily. Um, so I am going to allow you to talk. So you, if you can unmute yourself. Um, Hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? Um, my name is Emily Jackham. I'm the Director of Advancement and Communications at Mission Grammar School, which is just on the other side of the Basilica. Um, and I'm actually on here with one of our scholars, uh, Simon, who put that in the Q&A. Um, in a regular year, we use the playground every day um, with uh, kids from pre-K all the way up to sixth grade. And um, I don't know if you can unmute both of us at the same time, but um, Simon is one of our fifth graders who um, really <laughs> desires having a nice basketball court, obviously. Um, but I know from experience, I've been at Mission Grammar for three years and um, I know that the basketball court between our recess with Mission Grammar and the Tobin's recess is always um, like, a, we have to balance who's gonna be on it. Um, and we usually just cut that full circle in half um, if there's any overlapping recess times. 
Um, and so I think the desire for more space on the basketball court is definitely uh, there, um, especially because we both, both schools, the Tobin and Mission Grammar have, um, have kids who are a little bit older um, and want to play basketball. So um, I know that last school year, last fall, and the previous spring, um, there was some discussion between the Tobin and us about um, about like splitting the playground area and the ball field area. And it was definitely the ball field area that was less desired um, just because there was less interactive. Um, I mean, you could play baseball, I suppose, but there was less interactive items on that um, other than the field um, where the uh, kind of the playground area has uh, the different playscapes to play on, which is great. The swings also a hit in, in practice as well as on surveys. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and then the basketball court, um, I know that open field is really nice. Um, but oftentimes it's muddy, um, because grass does not grow there very well. Um, you guys might be the experts on that of how to make grass grow and stay there. But, um, I know that it's used for football and things like that. Um, and so it kind of creates a nice four segments of the playground. Um, but it almost seems to me like the amphitheater maybe should be below where that hangout space is um, because it seems just from my being in the area, I live just not on Smith Street, but close by. Um, and, uh, and I know that, you know, like some benches and tables would be nice to have on that, um, on that Smith Street side um, because otherwise people are just hanging out on the wall and playing dominoes on the wall, which is not really conducive to that. Um, but then also, having that amphitheater might um, be nice in the little like nook sort of area that follows the, the grain of that wall um, at the end, yeah, there. Um, and so, and I know that we would definitely utilize that. I know that the Tobin has a, like a, I don't know, I don't know if it's public, but um, like a stage area behind their school um, that sometimes we will use for like graduations and things, um, but that is a heavily used, um, heavily used thing at the Tobin um, and a desired space. So creating another one of those would seem to be, would make sense. Um, and then I know from being out at recess uh, that the basketball court is definitely a desired space. Mm. Emily, can I ask one follow-up to what you just said? Is yeah. it important to be able to keep the kids at, all at one level and some are playing football, some are on the play equipment and some are playing basketball or could basketball be at another level or does that cause problems in terms of keeping track of kids yeah that would cause problems okay. um, yeah uh, that's why we uh, initially when we had talks with Tobin about just with sometimes overlapping there would be like 60 kids out on the playground at one time with Tobin kids and our students um and so uh we kind of split it we would say like okay on these days when those times are happening we will go down to the um to the you know, basketball or the, sorry, the baseball field. Um, and then, uh, and then you guys will be up at the playground and it was always more desired to be up at the playground because there were so many different items that were there. You know, you, you could have kids, there was a lot of choice involved, right? Like you could have kids that were playing basketball. You could have kids that were playing football on the kind of like sloped grass area. You could have kids running around playing tag just generally, um, and you could have kids on the, on the playscapes as well. Um, and so it gave a lot of choice, and, but the eye line as a teacher, um, you can see everyone and can see what's going on, um, which is helpful. That is a lot of great feedback design team. Do you have any other questions for Emily or should we move on? No, I think that was super helpful. A lot of food for thought there. Um, yeah, I know. I Sorry, I, I don't know, I'll, mute, I'll, mute, I'll mute myself now, but um, I, if you want to email me, I'm, I'm more than happy to kind of follow up. And, and Simon and I are going to complete the survey together after this, um, after this meeting. Um, that so is great. I was going to say, actually, um, that our survey link is not up on our website yet. Um, Gary Walling also put a question in the Q&A. Um, he put his uh, Cindy Walling at gmail.com web uh, email address. So I'm gonna get in touch with him. If you wanna put your email address in the Q and A, um, I can let you know when it's up or you can check our, um, 
our project page because that is that is we're going to be posting the link for the survey um, probably by the end of this week. Great. So, I'll put mine and Simon's uh, email in. That would be great. And I want to unmute Simon, um, but there yeah. is some issue technically with um, the version of Zoom that he's using. It says that mm -hmm. I cannot, um, I can't unmute him for some reason. I would have to promote him to um, one of the panelists. So okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Simon, we would love to hear from you, but um, thank you for, thank you for putting your questions in the Q&A because at least that's, that's a, a meaningful way that we can spark our conversation and, and answer your questions. Yes, we've been email back and forth. <laughs> I just double check basketball dimensions, basketball court dimensions. So we'll be we'll be taking a look at that. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, so let's go back to the QA very quickly. Uh, Maggie Cohn says if the splash pad were moved, could it use the same elements and basic design as the existing feature? So design team, what do you think of that? I think we have options there. You know, and I think it depends on the location. You know, we showed some locations where the vertical elements probably wouldn't be as appropriate as some other locations. Um, so if it's the splash pad is meant to be a stage that has unobstructed views from different directions, the vertical elements could be a problem, although they also have like theatrical lighting. So potentially they could be incorporated in a pretty dramatic way. So I think that's something to be determined. Um, I think it's important for us to know if when that equipment, the splash pad equipment is running, is it fun to people like it and you want to perpetuate it if it's renovated or if you'd like to do something different? So um, Allison Poltinas also has her hand raised. So Allison, I'm gonna unmute you. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, a lot of options. I Cut out there for a second. Can you say that again, Allison? Um, hi. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my first question is, I'm going to make a plea for uh, four meetings instead of three. Um, there's so much to think about here. And now we've just been introduced to uh, thinking about basketball. So that's a new element too. So um, I know your system is usually just three community meetings, but this is such a big project and such an important uh, place in the neighborhood. So um, I am going to ask if possible, we can have four. Um, in order to um, hear more about, um, you know, narrowing down the options and not just being presented with one design, I think that's really important. Um, so I'm going to say a couple of things kind of quickly, I think. Um, I like the amphitheater idea. Um, I am, the existing stairs have a beautiful railing um, and you mentioned the connection with the church architecture. So. That's very, uh, it's a very artistic railing that was part of that redesign 15 years ago. So if it could be reused in some way, um, if you're rebuilding um, a terrace over the stone wall, I'm just wondering if there's ways to use that um, because I would hate to lose it. Um, the other area I'm kind of concerned about is the turf field in the playground area because it was it was talked about at the first meeting about how the grass gets worn down and kids play tag there and it's a slope. And even in the aerial views, you could see how, how worn down it was. So I'm just thinking again, how, is there a better, uh, something else that could happen there? I know we talked a little bit about sledding at one point at the first meeting and, um, Maybe if the hill is made steeper, um, I, I just, I'm not a landscape architect, so I don't know the answer, but just thinking that something different needs to happen with that turf area. Um, and all the playground equipment, I, um, I love the swings overlooking, um, you know, the city. I think that's really cool. I like the idea of moving the splash pad there too. If, if the vertical elements don't uh, interfere with the view, but um, I'm, I'm wondering too about 
how it connects with the views from the passive area, because that's the most important piece, I think, of the park for people right now is, is coming to Tremont Street and walking over to the stone wall and looking out at the city. So just thinking of how that gets enhanced. Um, and just a, a, a final plea for the ball field that um, you keep it accessible for Little League at the 200 feet outfield. I think that's important uh, for the league. Um, and um, one more question. Um, you didn't talk about the parking lots and last time you mentioned that they are officially part of the park. So I'm just wondering if, if so, some changes could happen to that driveway and parking, if how much, um, uh, if maybe the park size could be increased if, if uh, parking areas decreased. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Allison. That's a lot of, a lot of great feedback. Um, I think as far as the parking areas, we got our survey back, which indicates that our, our property line is basically includes the top parking area and then some of the lower parking area that um, is currently used by the school. Um, and as far as reducing the area for parking, um, that would need to be a conversation that um, we would need to have with the yeah. school. You know, obviously that would be something tough to spring on them because it's not many parking spaces and I'm sure they, they do depend on them. Um, but that is, that is an interesting, it's, it's good to, to think outside the bounds of the park. You know, it's, it's good to consider all options. Um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you for all of those thoughts. That's very helpful. Um, I'm gonna take one from the Q and A now, unless the design team wants to jump in for a minute with any thoughts or? No, I, I think you can keep going. Okay. Great. So Catherine Delory says, why is the area near the library, passive lawn, kept empty? Could the fitness equipment be located there? So I'm not sure if she's referring to the lawn area mm -hmm. that's part of the playground. I think so. Okay. Well, I, was, I think she means this area yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think what we've heard in a few different comments is, you know, is that the best use of that space? You know, that comment could, is it fitness equipment or is it an opportunity to expand basketball or is it make it a better lawn that works for football and multiple purposes? So um, it says that space is valuable and we have to look at what's the best use for it. Um, so Gary Walling says, in the overall plan of the park, the parking space behind the library is considered part of the park complex. Could that be converted to play space, perhaps basketball court? Parking is not really a highest best use. Um, so we're, we're getting some, some good strong feedback here about repurposing parking, which I, I totally respect. Um, we would certainly need to have a conversation with the library and perhaps it is something where they only use three of those spaces or something like that. Um, it's definitely, it's a conversation that we would have to start. And I think based on the feedback that we've gotten tonight, um, we will, you know, we'll, we'll start talking to both the school and the library and just see what their uses of those space are because, you know, right now it is pervious, you know, like rain is not absorbing in there. Um, it's also in pretty poor condition. So, you know, we, we could address it as part of this project. Um, so thank you for, for sparking our, sparking our interest and in, in bringing these things up. Um, so no one's raising their hand. So we'll keep going with the Q and A. Um, Maggie Cohn says the splash pad has been used as a performance space in the past and I don't run in the splash pad, but I love to see it when it is on and lit, always full of kids. That's interesting that it has been used as a performance space in the past. That's interesting. Um, yeah, Maggie Cohn, you're raising your hand. Um, Christine, can you unmute or do you wanna? I'm working on it. Sorry. I think I'm unmuted. <clears throat> yes, you are. Now we've had uh, at different times, organi different organizations have had events in the park 
and I've seen um, there's a group of Chinese dancers from um, Roxbury Tenants of Harvard who have performed dance on the splash pad. And at different times, there's been musicians who performed on this on the splash pad. So, um, and in those, it may be sort of a, a limited kind of performance, but the vertical elements of the the water feature actually are. I think Kyle said this. They are sort of dramatic, and and when the lights are on, it actually makes it look like a little stage. So it's it's actually it was not its intention, but it's really kind of functional that way. Yeah, that's great to hear that because I, I wouldn't, you know, the, the spray features are sort of dense enough, but I, I that, that makes perfect sense now that you're explaining it. So you have to make sure cool. the water's off when someone's performing. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unexpected element of the performance. Everyone's soaked. <laughs> and um, Gary Walling just added that that splash pad has been used as a Tito Puentes jazz series also. But, he, but it also add to that comment that the amphitheater stairs would pair nicely with it as the as a performance space. So would it work? Um, just trying to think of the plan, like would we be able to add the amphitheater stairs along with the existing splash pad? Would that fit? Do you know? I think you could. It would probably take a bit more. They're a bit they're a bit far apart, I think, but it depends on how we design the amphitheater. So if we could we could pull it, it would probably require pulling it out, but it's certainly something that we can look at. Okay. I mean, these are the things that this meeting is sort of fun to think about is like what what pieces of each design do you want to see together? You know, and and what what things don't you, you know, you don't like in the first place or what what haven't we considered? So I think we're getting a lot of a lot of really great feedback for all of these things. Um, Maggie also added, the last redesign opened up the wall from the top tier to the play area for better visibility. So I understand why you are expanding that. So that's nice. Um, so I think if we could go back at this, Allison has raised her hand again. Yep. All right, Allison, you're on. Oh, hi. Um, I just uh, wanted to emphasize, and you've mentioned this a lot, how important it is to do uh, a safe walking route from Smith Street to Tremont so that people are not walking in the uh, driveway uh, there. I think that's, that's like, to me, that's almost the most important piece of this whole project. Um, and when you do that, um, I don't know if you'll have to take, um, create a sidewalk where the road is now, or hopefully you're not taking away green space in order to do that. But um, uh, if anything, I would suggest narrowing the, uh, the driveway. Um, and also when you're adding all this hardscape, if you can think about making things more permeable, so um, pervious, that's the word, right? Uh, so that uh, rainwater does drain better, because I'm worried that, um, We'll be losing some of the uh, some of the grass. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. I mean, design team. What is the um, the width right now? I know when you are driving up right at the entrance to Smith Street, um, it's narrow. It, it's very very narrow. So, um, you know, a sidewalk. If we add something that is similar to your standard sidewalk, it would be. I think six feet wide. So that would probably mean that a strip of the grassy area um, has to be converted, but I haven't, I haven't looked closely at it. So um, Danielle or Kyle, do you want to speak to that? Well, I was staring at it today a little bit too, because I was worried about only thinking about the adding a sidewalk on the baseball field side, because there is part of a sidewalk on the school side, but there's some obstacles in the way, but um, I think there's, from a feasibility standpoint, a sidewalk could be made continuous on the school side as well. So I think we're gonna to have to look at both and really see what makes sense. And of course, we gotta check property lines and all that kind of thing too. So um, Q and A, uh, Emily has, Emily Jackim has a couple of um, comments here. She says, I think the space 
that is on the slope between the library and the seating area would be a great spot for a workout area. Okay, so noted, that seems like two people with that suggestion. Um, and the stairs are not safe, especially in the winter. So if the amphitheater is put in, you'd wanna make sure that it would allow for ice and snow. So definitely good considerations. Um, Gary has his hand up. Awesome. Go ahead, Gary. Hi. Um, first off, I want to thank um, everybody that's been involved um, with some of these designs. They're very thoughtful, a lot to think about, really have thought about our space. It is such a tremendous space because of the views of the city and everything. So I really like, I mean, those, those swings and or using space like that. I really like that. I love that amphitheater style seating, if it could be doable. It just really makes it a dramatic look towards that part of the city. I think that's great. Um, again, just another plug. Uh, so my kids went to the, the Hurley School in the South End, and there was a parking lot um, that uh, was their only outdoor space. Well, they had a, a little bit of a playground, but the parking lot, um, they actually, that was their athletic field. So if you can imagine being able to try and play any kind of soccer or anything of, like on Absolutely. asphalt and all that other stuff. It was awful. And we just decided parking wasn't as good as a playground. So they put in a soccer field. Um, it was a tiny little soccer field. So, I mean, it was an elementary school. So, um, but it actually became, it was, it's used in the summertime when school's not in session. You see adults in there playing soccer. Um, so I know people kind of get used to their parking and everything like that. Um, I, it, it makes me, I, I really feel for the students when they're, they're um, really, I wouldn't say battling, but trying to negotiate usage of such a tiny little basketball space now. I just look at that parking and I think, boy, you know, you could put a half size court in there and still have enough room for parking or just get rid of it entirely and have a little higher best use. So I know it's been mentioned, but I just want to reiterate, um, I think people get used to the idea of being able to park because they think that's always the way it's been. But I think highest and best use, I think there would be a lot of kids that would use that on a daily basis during school and also summertime and things like that. Whereas the parking is not used as often um, when the library is not open and, and school's out for the summer. That's great feedback, yeah, and 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 that's true. You know, it's a uh, people do get used to and sort of stuck in their in their habits of um, <clears throat> always driving. And and you're right. You know, we do need to consider um, what the best uses are for these spaces. So um, definitely, after this meeting, we're going to be excuse me. <laughs> um, we're going to be reaching out to the library and the school and just get the conversation started. So Maggie has her hand up again. <clears throat> Go ahead, Maggie. Um, yeah, I just, so I've been thinking about the suggestion that there be a larger <clears throat> sort of seating area with tables in the middle or towards the back of the playground, the play area. And I, I mean, in a way I can see where that might work well for people taking classes out for to have the children eating and playing in the same area, but I would definitely want to see tables and chairs still up in the passive section because, because that's where I would want to eat my sandwich as opposed to in the middle of a playground. So I, I, I'm just not sure those are two good uses to put in the same general area. Thank you, Maggie. Design team, what do you, what do you think about that? Yeah. I was just gonna say there's another comment here from John who kind of reiterates that statement says also regarding one of the playground area options. Um, I think having picnic sitting area in the middle of the playground, I think there's a not missing, but I think it does not seem as desirable as that seems like it attract more adults who maybe better better serve sitting in the more passive area and saving the playground area for kids at the playground and splash pad space, especially a flat splash pad space that could be utilized vers versatile throughout the year, such as stage space as shown in one of the other concepts. Um, he also said, I think that having a flat 
splash pad, that's hard to say, is more important than the occasional ambiance of vertical structures in the splash pad area. So I think it's, you know, we looked at trying to, a couple different options of ways to bring more people into that middle tier um, and, and knowing that some of the classes do come up to use um, to, to have their lunches in the park, in the playground. Um, but, but I think that we, we hear a couple comments that maybe that's not the best way, um, the best space. So I think if we have tables, um, clearly to maintain the tables up at the Tremont Street side in the Pasadena Park. Yeah, one thing to note right now is that the, <clears throat> the tables that are set up on the passive, in the passive section underneath that large tree, um, those are not accessible. Um, and so those would need to be, you know, we're, we're thinking about different areas for seating for that reason. Um, anyway. Along with also Allison. projecting the trees, the mature trees that are there. Allison, go ahead. Yeah, hi again. Um, just a couple of things about the library. Um, uh, the park is almost like the library's park in a way because it is a, a hot spot for uh, BPL Wi-Fi right now and probably will continue in the future. Um, so people can use um, their, um, you know, their laptops there. Um, so just thinking about that and, and the need for um, some places for not necessarily solitude, but some use of computers, whatever. Um, and also that the library has does have their own uh, driveway and parking from Tremont. So um, the question of the library parking lot, I think is really important to figure out because um, honestly, I don't think it's used by the library staff. Um, so that's just an interesting um, uh, problem to solve because if you do create a, um, a play area there, whether it's basketball or, or exercise equipment or whatever, um, you have to think about um, uh, crossing, uh, you know, the, uh, the access back and forth across the driveway and, and making it safe. But um, I didn't get an answer to my uh, comment about reuse of the, the existing railing on the stairs and whether you think that's possible. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's some thoughts on that too. Thanks. Sorry, Allison, that was, you were referring to the decorative railing that went in for right. in the last project. Okay, all right. right. Um, design team, what do you what do you think about, have you noticed the, because oftentimes what can happen is the condition of a railing will not make it um, feasible to reuse it, but um, have you guys noticed if the condition, do you think would allow for that? Yeah, I think it's in good condition. Um, and it, you know, it's very attractive and it has that same motif that you see repeated at the entry gate, the fence on the edge of the upper terrace and in the splash pad itself. So it's something we'll definitely look to salvage if we can, as long as it can be used similar to its current form, because when you have to adapt it to a new form, you, it starts to get expensive for you know what you get out of it. Yeah, and all of these, all of these things, you know, we we have a budget that is pretty good for the site. You know, it's about two, $2.5 million for construction, um, but it is a large site. And so we need to sort of understand the more we move things around, um, the more we do significant grade changes, the, you know, that's where we will spend our money. And so, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that we can address all areas of the site that everybody has, has mentioned and brought up as being really significant and important. Um, but that's just, it's always a matter of, you know, funding for public spaces. It's, it's never like this bottomless bag of money, unfortunately. So something we have to keep in mind. Um, Emily says, would love to do a walking tour with a few students if possible. Um, just curious, Emily, if you wanna continue with the Q and A, um, do a walking tour with the design team or um, anyway, if you could email me or I could email you after this session, um, we could we could talk further about that. Um, that could be a great idea. And then John also says, Allison referenced Wi-Fi connectivity from the library. Is that the same or similar to the city's wicked free Wi-Fi program? Would it be possible to extend connectivity throughout the park? Um, I do not know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, 
Allison, do you know that? <laughs> Not sure if Allison is still with us. Well, I know it's been done in other parks we've worked on. It's not, you know, um, it's not something the Boston Parks Department does, but we can collaborate with um, the other city department that can do that. So I think it is possible. That's a great idea. Thanks for bringing that up, John. All right, are there any other thoughts or questions, strong opinions or not so strong opinions? We'd love to hear all of them. Allison has her hand up. Go ahead, Allison. Hi, thank you again for listening. Um, I wasn't clear with the uh, passive park options. Um, is that circular bench around the tree? Is that preserved for all three in all three options? I think it's different in each option, but we'd love to hear from you all how you feel about it. It is a good way to protect that tree. Um, I think in one option we moved pavement away from the tree in general and moved seating away from it. Um, so that's something still to be determined. Um, we are a little, there's a couple things we are worried about. You know, um, as B mentioned, the picnic tables kind of crammed all together need to be addressed because they're not accessible. Also, and this can be addressed through lighting, that's actually one of the darkest spots of the park um, on the back side between the wall and that tree. So that's something we can solve, but it's something that we're, you know, considering as well. Okay, that's great. Um, and the lighting, are you talking about um, um, LED lights? And um, I, you hadn't talked too much about fixtures or anything yet, right? Yep, the fixtures would be um, the standard fixtures that are the city of Boston fixtures that are standard throughout Boston parks that Boston street lighting owns and maintains, but they are LED fixtures. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Well, um, it is 726. Somehow this is kind of an amazing group. I feel like we give this presentation and we have this conversation and then magically like things dwindle down and it happens to be just about 730. This is kind of incredible. Um, if we don't have any more comments or any more questions, um, let's flip to the the last page, here we are, we have our project website, um, which you can scan the QR code here with your phone, or you can copy the, um, the address for the website. And I have a lot of your email addresses from the Q&A. So um, anybody who wants me to email them directly when our survey is up, I can certainly do that. Just put that in the Q&A um, if you haven't already. Um, and Otherwise, check back at the website. I'll, everybody who's on my email list, if you've emailed me once, you're going to stay on my email list. Um, so don't worry about that. But you know, if you are on my email list, I will let you know when our third community meeting is. Um, and hopefully we will see all of you guys and more for that. Um, tell all of your friends and neighbors, just get as much of the word out as possible because you know, we wanna bring everybody along with this design process and and hearing that, you know, seven people want, you know, basketball or something at the third meeting is difficult to accommodate. So we wanna we wanna have as many people weigh in now with our survey um, as possible. So Allison has her hand up. Uh, hi, just uh, one more question about um, how many people are participating in this meeting. Um, so we have uh, nine attendees. Nine. I should have said that. That's actually on my list to like tell people how many people were communicating. Yeah, that's that. not great. Um, yeah. yeah, it's nine. So yeah, that's too bad. I mean, I do feel like this is a little rushed. Um, again, my plea for four meetings, but I know you have a budget. Thanks. Thank you, Allison.
All right, and so we look forward to hearing back from you all and as, as many other people as you can spread the word to. Have a good night. Thank you.